Good morning. Everybody doing okay? You guys good? Good. It's like three people over here who are good. Glad you guys are here this morning. Um, been working through the gospel of John. I don't know how long we've been in this. We've been in it for a while, and we are getting dangerously close to the end of John. We got this weekend, we got next weekend, which, man, the conclusion of John, I just think, is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, so we've got two more weekends of this, and then we're, and we're done. Have I told you guys what we're going to do next? First Samuel. Yes, maybe you remembered that. I just thought it was a fitting time to go into a book of the Bible about how the people of God wanted an earthly king versus the king of kings. I just thought it was an interesting time to kind of do that. So uh, if you're not, not picking up what I'm laying down there. So um, we'll get into that, and we'll be in that through the end of the year, and that'll be fun. If you've never read much of the Old Testament, I don't know why people neglect the Old Testament. The Old Testament is wild. It is wild. I always tell people... Um, the, the Old Testament is descriptive, not prescriptive. What that means is you shouldn't do everything you read in the Old Testament because there is, there's a lot of bad things that people do. But it describes history, and, and it's when you read the Old Testament that you're like, oh, that's why Jesus came because <laughs> we were a messed up lot. And um, that's why Jesus will come again because uh, we're kind of going down similar paths. So it's, it's fascinating to read those stories, and we'll... Get into that, and you guys can make fun of me because I have a really hard time pronouncing Hebrew names, and in a church this size, there's always those Hebrew scholars that, that uh, send me emails, you pronounce that wrong, and I love that, and uh, you guys can do that for months, <laughs> and um, it'll be good times, but, but we still have two more weeks of the Gospel of John. Last week uh, was heavy, uh, chapter 20, or I'm sorry, chapter 19 is heavy, it's about the death of Christ, it's about the crucifixion, there's, there's nothing joyous or, or really happy about that, that subject. It is, is very, very heavy. It is very, very heartbreaking and, and dark. Um, but of course, we know that, that, that there is a change, that there is a turnaround, that there is a resurrection. And so it's interesting, whenever people say the most important thing in human history was the crucifixion of Christ, well, that, that, I don't believe that to be true. I believe it's what happened three days after the crucifixion. That is the most important thing. Um, and good people can die for you, but there's only one that could resurrect themselves for you. And, and that's why I love talking about the resurrection. And, and chapter 20 is a, a very powerful, very uplifting. You, 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 you smile at parts of it as after all of this darkness we then see this amazing light that is chapter 20. So if you weren't here last week, um, John's account of the crucifixion and the resurrection is a little different than the other three gospels. We call them the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, but, but they all have different audiences. They are all trying to use different examples and stories from the life of Christ to, to kind of show different kind of people um, who Jesus is. And John's account of the crucifixion is dramatically different than the other accounts because G, uh, John is not focusing on necessarily the events of what is happening at the crucifixion. John is focusing on the one who is on the cross. Who is this one that is on the cross and why is he getting on the cross? That's kind of what John talks about in chapter 19. It's what we talked about last week. This week, of course, we will be talking about the resurrection. Um, here's what we're going to do with that, with, with this conversation of the resurrection. I think a lot of us intellectually in our minds know that Jesus Christ came, he died, and he rose for us. I don't think we apply that to our lives as much as we should. That we serve a God that loves us so much, he would come, die, resurrect for us, empower us, fill us with his spirit. I don't, I don't, I don't know if we live that as much as we should. So we're going to talk about what do we truly lean into? What do we truly bank on? Where is our hope? Where is our trust? Where do we run when times get tough? And hopefully the answer for that, or if not that, hopefully it will become the answer, is the crucified Christ, the, the, the resurrected Christ, that that's what we lean into, okay? So you should have got a notes hand out when you walked in. Everything is in there. Everything will be on the screen. If you have an experienced community app, uh, just download that, click on sermon notes, everything's right there. We're in the fourth book of the New Testament, we'll do all of it, and we'll get through it relatively quickly. It's pretty simple, straightforward stuff. And we'll hang out a little bit at the end just talking about, practically speaking, what does it mean that we, we follow a resurrected Savior? What does that mean? We'll talk about that, okay? So, all right, hope you're doing well. How's the weather outside? It's good. I like hot. Uh, is it sunny? 
Yeah, I like that too. Awesome. Um, all right. Well, cool. Well, let's pray. Uh, let's jump into this, and we'll see where the Lord takes us, okay? And then you can go enjoy your hot, sunny Sunday, all right? Father God, we love you. Lord, thank you for everyone in this room. Thank you, God, that, that people would give up a couple of hours from their, their weekend, Lord, to come in and to worship you and to break open the word and to study and learn more, a little bit more about you, God. I pray, Lord, that as we study and as we worship today, God, that you bless us, that you, that, that you touch our hearts, God. Lord, I pray that we not only intellectually know what you did for us, but I, I pray that, God, we live that, that we apply that, God. Father, we pray not only for our church, we pray for every church in our city, pray for our other campuses and the churches in those cities, and pray that we can be a blessing to this community, Lord. We love you, and we thank you, God. Pray all these things in your son's name, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So at the end of chapter 19, we end with Joseph of Arimathea, a very rich, influential man, and, and Nicodemus, same thing, very educated, influential, affluential. These two men get the body of Jesus Christ. They start to prepare Jesus' body according to Jewish uh, burial ceremonies. But because of the Sabbath day, they were not able to complete that. So now we have Mary in chapter 20 showing up early the next morning to finish what they started, okay? That's where we pick up. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was dark. She saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she went running to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, that's John, and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they've put him. At that, Peter and the other disciple went out heading for the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then following him, Simon Peter also came. He entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. The wrapping that had been on Jesus' head was not lying with the linen cloths, but was folded up in a separate place by itself. The other disciple who had reached the tomb first then also went in, saw, and believed. For they did not yet understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. Okay, said this earlier. I'm going to say it again because it's important. If one reads the Bible, if one reads the four gospels, you'll see that there are differences in the four gospels. There's not discrepancies, there are differences. The reason why is there's a lot more than Jesus did, we'll learn this at the end of this lesson, that, that is not recorded. So the different authors of the gospels took different parts of Jesus's ministry, recorded those things because they were speaking to different audiences. For instance, Matthew was writing to a predominantly Jewish audience. So the way he wrote about Jesus was slanted to persuade Jewish people, and particularly that Jesus Christ is the prophesied Messiah. John wrote to Jews, but mostly to Greeks and Romans. So he included a lot of things in there that would appeal to Greeks and Romans in the hopes of convincing them that Jesus is the Savior. So here's the bottom line. Oftentimes people will, will come up to you, or maybe you've heard people say this on YouTube or whatever. They'll say, uh, well, there are discrepancies in the Bible, so we have to throw it all away. 99% of the time, the people who make such claims have never read the Bible. That's one problem. The other problem is, with just a little bit of cultural, historical, and biblical study, you will see that there are not discrepancies in the Bible. There are no contradictions, and it can be explained. The problem is, is that takes a little bit of work, and, and oftentimes people don't want to put that work into it. But if you put that work into it, you will see there are no discrepancies. So we are not, we are not exactly positive what day of the week Jesus died. Most people think it's Friday, celebrate Good Friday. Um, if you look at how Jewish days work, a lot of people don't think that Friday would work. They would think it would have to be a Wednesday or a Thursday. It's irrelevant. It's a minor. But what we do know is that Jesus was in the tomb for three days in the tomb of a guy named Joseph of Arimathea. And on Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene shows up with a couple of other women to finish the, the, the burial ceremonies that those other guys started, that Joseph and Nicodemus started. But when Mary gets there, she sees that the stone of the tomb is gone. It is removed. Now, she assumes that the body of Jesus is not there, 
She takes off running back to Peter to tell Peter. And if you've been with us for the last couple of weeks, you, you would understand that Peter is kind of an ironic person to go tell this to. The reason why that's ironic is Peter, though he was probably the oldest and kind of the unofficial leader at this point of the disciples, Peter is also the guy that denied Jesus three times in a 24-hour period. But this is who Mary runs and talk to, uh, talks to. Peter and John, I'm guessing John was close by. They take off running towards the tomb, which was very culturally inappropriate. Uh, back in Jesus's day, grown men didn't, didn't run around. We do that for fun now. I don't do that for fun, but some of you may do that for fun. In, Je in Jesus's time, you can obviously tell I don't run for fun. In Jesus's time, um, it was very culturally inappropriate for grown men to run like that. They did not care. This was big news, and they took off running. I love, love, love that John, the author of this, included that he was a faster runner than Peter. You can't beat that. That is just one of those gems in the Bible. Not only does John say, I'm the disciple Jesus loved, I'm also the fastest disciple. <laughs> and that is fantastic. So when they get to the tomb, John beats Peter to the tomb. This is very interesting. But when he gets there, he's, he stops. And he does not go in the tomb. Why? Well, John was also the only one of the 12 disciples that saw Jesus get crucified. Imagine if, if this is, uh, I'm sorry to get so graphic, but imagine if you come across a, a, a car accident and it was someone that you loved and their body was mangled. And then someone said, hey, come in here and, and look in their tomb. You're probably like, I, I don't want to see that. So there might have been this apprehension of John when he got there. He's like, I don't want to see what might be in there. Peter, on the other hand, probably out of guilt, jumps right in the tomb. Probably not just out of guilt because he denied Jesus three times. Peter was very impulsive. Sometimes Peter did things and then he kind of thought about it after the fact, right? So Peter jumps right in and he notices, A, that the body is gone, and B, that the linens are not just thrown all over the place, they're neatly folded up in the corner. This is very strange, right? Because if thieves came in and took the body, typically if thieves break into your house, they don't like make your bed at the same time. <laughs> if they do, I am mean, very, very nice thief there. But the, the, more than likely, this wasn't anything spontaneous. This was premeditated. This had been thoroughly thought out and, and very uh, deliberately executed. Now, here's what's interesting. Peter and John left amazed, according to the Gospel of Luke, but they shouldn't have been amazed. They should have, they should have known this was coming. Why? Because Jesus flat out told them. Jesus said, they're going to kill me. I'm going to be dead three days and I'll rise again. Jesus said this directly to them several times. Not only that, the scripture, the Old Testament foretold this in pretty good detail. The reason why, though, Peter and John couldn't connect the word and what happened is they didn't have the, the, they, they didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. They hadn't been given the Holy Spirit of God so they could maybe understand on some level the, the word of God, but they couldn't understand on every level what they needed to from the word of God. And what we learn from that is this. If we approach this book just intellectually, which we should approach it intellectually, but if we approach this book just with our intellect, we, we may understand what it says, but we do not fully understand the spiritual implications and principles in this book. We have to approach God and we have to approach the word of God, not just with our mind, but with a spiritual hunger, with, with our hearts as well, with a desire to learn spiritually. It's like when we pick up this book and read it simply from an intellectual level, we'll come across a principle of, of Jesus, something like, um, if you want to lose your life, you have to find it. And on an intellectual level, we're like, well, if you've lost it, how can you find it? From a spiritual level, when we read that we have to lose our life to find it, it makes absolutely perfect sense. I have to give up everything in order to find what it truly means to live in Christ. But it takes the spirit deciphering principles like that for us. So if we approach this just from an intellectual standpoint, right, or a scholarly standpoint, we, we, we miss it. We do not get the full comprehension of what God is telling us, okay? But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she was crying, she stooped to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting there where Jesus' body had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you crying? 
because they've taken away my Lord, she told them, and I don't know where they've put him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't know that it was Jesus. Woman, Jesus said to her, why are you crying? Who is it that you're seeking? Supposing he was the gardener, she replied, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. Turning around, she said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus told her, since I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers, <coughs> pardon me, and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and she told them what he had said to her. Okay, so after Peter and John went back to where they were staying, Mary, and if you don't know anything about Mary Magdalene, this is, this is not only a woman in a time when women were not valued as much as men, which I'm, I'm not trying to be mean here. In the majority of the Middle East, women are still not valued uh, nearly as much as men. And, and again, I'm not trying to be divisive or a jerk here, but even in the Quran, it says that a woman is worth half as much as a man. It takes two women to equal one man, uh, according to Islamic doctrine. So in the majority of, of the Middle East, women are still not valued. And in this time, even with the Jewish people, um, women were not as valued as much as men. So I find it interesting that the first witness of the resurrected Savior is not only a woman, but a woman who had a very, very, very bad reputation once upon a time. I do not think this is an accident. I think this is very much on purpose. Sometimes people say, well, the, the Bible is misogynistic. That is absolutely not true. Absolutely not true. Jesus is not misogynistic. The, the, the true followers of Jesus are, are, are not misogynistic. And I believe it to be intentional that not, not only did Jesus reveal his resurrected self to a woman, but a woman who had a horrible history. And what this shows us about God is that God loves everyone equally, gender, color, nationality, even the mistakes we have made in the past, and that God is extremely gracious if we want to follow him. We learn that from the fact that Mary was the first one to see the resurrected Christ. Now, before she bumps into Christ, she pops her head into the tomb and she sees two angels. Now, I don't believe she understood that these were angels. I don't know if they kind of diminished their, their bling a little bit or what they did, but if you, that's a horrible way of putting that, isn't it? But if you read John, who wrote the Gospel of John, also wrote the book of Revelation, in chapter one of Revelation, when John saw an angel, he said he passed out like a dead man because it's, it's intense to see an angel. So I'm guessing that she didn't fully comprehend who these two men were. But she walks in, what are you looking for? I'm looking for my Lord. Do, do you know where they've taken him? Now, if one reads throughout the Bible, Angels are typically either doing the work of the Lord or they are telling people about what the Lord is doing. And we see that in Luke. We see that basically the entire book of Revelation. And so possibly in a moment of embarrassment, possibly in a moment of just overwhelming emotion, Mary runs out of the tomb. And I don't know if she literally ran into to, to Jesus, but came across a third individual and she just assumed this was the caretaker. She assumed this was the gardener in this area. And someone would ask, well, how in the heck did she not recognize Jesus? She was at the crucifixion, followed Jesus for, for many years. Why didn't she recognize him? Well, you got to think. She probably had her eyes down. Her eyes were full of tears and not just like a couple of tears. She was probably sobbing pretty heavy, that kind of guttural deep sobbing that eventually hurts your stomach and makes your stomach sore. She was probably sobbing very, very hard, sees this guy, stops, and Jesus says, Woman, what are you looking for? Why are you crying? And she still did not understand who this was. Maybe even Mary, like Peter and John, forgot the teachings of the Old Testament, forgot what Jesus had told them about the crucifixion. But here's what we're reminded of in this situation. This is gonna sound a little metaphorical, but I'm gonna try to connect it. In these situations, when we find ourselves overrun with stress, with turmoil, with depression, with anxiety, with fear, whatever the case may be, whenever something as tragic has happened in our lives, we have to be careful that we are not looking down, letting our emotions overwhelm us. We have to be looking up at Jesus. 
This is very important. We also have to remember, because not all the time do we instantly feel Jesus, but in those times when we don't instantly feel Jesus, we have to remember the promises of the word of God. We have to remember what the word says. We have to remember the hope and the foundation that the word gives us. And in this moment, Mary kind of momentarily forgot that. So even after Jesus says, who are you looking for? Why are you crying? It wasn't, and I find this so beautiful, it wasn't until Jesus said her name. And right when he said, Mary, instantly it clicked. And what do we learn from that? We learn that we not just worship the Savior, we learn that the Savior is personal. We don't just follow God. God's not just some cosmic being way out there in deep space. God is a personal God. He knows our name. And listen, I believe every single human that has ever lived, I believe God calls our name. It's just a matter of, are we listening? Will we recognize it when he says our name? And right when he says her name, boom, she gets it. And she realizes, teacher, teacher, it's you. And so verse 17 is interesting. You can imagine if you had someone that you loved as much as Mary loved Jesus, come back from the dead, you can imagine what she did. I, I, I imagine in my mind, it doesn't say it, but, but it, it kind of alludes to this, that she probably leapt and probably grabbed him around the torso, right? Wrapped her arms around his body and didn't want to let him go. She didn't want to lose him again. And at this, Jesus says, Mary, you cannot cling to me. Why did he say that? He said that because Jesus is about to leave in physical form. So what was going to have to happen from this point on out Everyone was going to have to get used to not having Jesus there physically, but they were going to have the Holy Spirit, which meant Jesus would be there with them spiritually. And this is the same thing with us. As of right now, you and I don't have the physical Jesus with us. We have the spiritual Jesus with us. We have the Holy Spirit. Now, one day, Jesus Christ will come back physically. Acts chapter 1 says he will return exactly the way he left, that Jesus will come back physically, and then we will be with him physically physically. For eternity, but as of right now, we have Jesus spiritually. Listen, this is why we are called to walk by our spiritual faith, not our physical sight, because we don't have a physical Jesus right now. We have a spiritual Jesus right now. I hope that that is clear how I'm saying that. So we're to walk by spiritual faith. Now, in in the spirit of transparency, and if you're new at this church, we kind of pride ourselves in being honest people. If you are an honest Christian, I don't know if there's such thing as a dishonest Christian, but if you're an honest Christian in here, all of us will admit that it is not always easy to walk by supernatural faith. Oh, Corey, it is for me. You're a liar, and you can repent before you take communion later on in this service. Listen, if we're being honest in this room, every honest Christian will tell you at one point or another in their life, they will look at themselves in the mirror and wonder if they're crazy. That's just the real side of it. Of course, faith kicks in. Of course, uh, our relationship with God kicks in. But we have to learn to build that muscle. We have to learn to build that trust and reputation in God. How do we do that? The first thing is, is we have to talk to God. The more we pray, the more our confidence builds in him. The more our relationships uh, uh, with God gets deeper. Not only do we need to pray to God, and people ask me, Corey, should I pray every day? I say, you should pray three times a day. You should pray four times a day. You should, the Bible says to pray without ceasing. That means even in the little things, if we're going on a trip, hey, pray before you take that trip. You know, turn off the radio sometimes before you go to bed, when you wake up, just touch base with God throughout the day. It's important. We also need to surround ourselves with good people. You know a good place to do that? Church. It's a good place to meet good people. They're not perfect people, but they're like-minded people that are, that are on the same journey that you are, and we need that. The Bible says that iron sharpens iron. We need good, strong people in our lives to hold us accountable, to pray for us, to love us, to be there when we need them. The Bible also says that bad company corrupts good morals. You know what that means? If you hang out with dirt bags all the time, you inevitably become a dirt bag. Bad company corrupts good morals. That's what that does. Now listen, you need to have friends that aren't believers because we are called to go out into the world to love all kinds of people and to share the gospel with them. So we're not to create social enclaves where we only hang out with people just like us. We are to have a diversity of friends, but we need that base of strong believers in our life. 
We also need to read the Bible because again, sometimes we don't have it right here and we have to bank on what we have up here. Sometimes we don't feel it, but we have to know the truth. And the word of God tells us the truth, gives us wisdom, gives us insight. The last thing that we can do to build our kind of spiritual muscle, our faith, that, that, that reputation with God, is we need to look at the fruit of a world, listen, that walks by its physical senses. Do you hear me? We need to look at the, at the fruit of a world that says, follow your lust, follow your taste, follow what you feel. And when I look at the fruit of, of a world living by physical trust, um, that's rotten fruit to me, and I don't want it. I want something different. So we are to walk by spiritual sight, not by physical, right? And we have to build that muscle. Okay, let's keep on going. When it was evening on the first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked because they feared the Jews. Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, Peace be with you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the father has sent me, this is important. I also send you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So despite Mary's report, Jesus Christ is resurrected. I have seen him. The disciples were still afraid. Why? Because they were human. And they locked themselves in, in, in a little home. And they were probably worshiping. They were probably eating dinner together, talking, maybe praying. And as they were gathered, Jesus stood amongst them and said, Shalom, which probably scared them half to death, right? So the, the, the resurrected Savior, hey, peace be with you. And they're like, ah, okay. And so again, he had to say, peace be with you. So to the disciples, they thought that locked doors would protect them. To the reader of this gospel, we understand that, that, that if Jesus can resurrect himself from the dead and escape the grave, uh, a locked door is probably not gonna do much. What we learn is if Jesus wants to get to us, Jesus will get to us. Jesus does what Jesus wants to do. Why? Because he's the creator God, right? So we learn that there's nothing that can stop Jesus. So after showing his scars, he says, look at my hands, look at my side. Jesus prepares the 10 disciples to be sent out to teach. I thought there were 12. Well, Judas has committed suicide by this point. And, and we don't know exactly where Thomas is, but, 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 but he's out somewhere. So he breathes on these 10, and I, and I imagine he eventually does this for Thomas. We'll read that here in a second. He breathes on the 10, and they receive the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit would be officially poured out, or, or um, it would be available to anyone, but that wouldn't happen for another 50 days after this point. That's in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit is poured out on mankind. The reason why the disciples got the Holy Spirit first is when the Holy Spirit was poured out on everyone, someone had to be there to be able to instruct them, to teach them, to, to, to tell everyone what is going on, right? To tell the masses. And it's beautiful in Acts chapter two, this is where Peter, who at this point is, is a big coward, right? We see Peter in Acts chapter two become the rock, become this phenomenal leader, this phenomenal teacher. He gets up and teaches, in my opinion, probably the best gospel message that's recorded in the Bible, and he, and, and he lays it out there for him. But they had to have the Holy Spirit first. And then verse 23 is interesting. Um, some of you came from... from from denominations that, that misinterpret verse 23, and some people read verse 23, and they say, well, some people have the authority by God to forgive sin. Um, no human has the ability to, to absolve sin. No human has the ability to, to, to retain or forgive sin. So, so what does this mean? Is this a contradiction? No, it's not a contradiction. What Jesus is saying here is he has now given these disciples his word, right? He has given them his instruction. He has told them the word of God, and they had the Old Testament, but now we have the New and Old Testament. We have the, the word of God as followers of, of Jesus, which tells us what is right and wrong. Not only do we have the word of God that tells us what is right and wrong, we also have the Holy Spirit 
that Jesus gave us, right? We have the Holy Spirit that gives us discernment and wisdom to know what is right and wrong. So what Jesus is saying to his followers right here is, because you have my spirit, that compass, right? Because you have the word of God, the clarity that I've given you, you have the authority as my follower to tell people what is a sin and what is not a sin. You have the authority to determine what is right and what is wrong. Now, when we say things like that, like if someone gets on a stage like this and says, uh, a certain sexual act, you know, whatever that is, sex outside of marriage, or the case, this is a sin, people go, well, only God can judge me. Well, listen, ultimately, yes, before you go to heaven or hell, it will be God that, that makes that distinction where you go. But God has given his followers the authority to say to the world around them, if you do this, you are sinning against God and this will separate you, separate you from him for eternity. We've been given that authority by God to determine what is sin and what is not sin according to his word and according to the leading of the Holy Spirit that should be in us. That's what that means, okay? All right, we're almost done. But Thomas, called twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were telling him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, if I don't see the mark of nails in his hands, put my finger into the mark of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. A week later, his disciples were indoors again and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Don't be faithless, but believe. Thomas responded to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written to you that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And by believing, this is very important, and by believing, you may have life in his name. Okay. Some Christians are gullible. I'm, I'm not trying to be mean. You guys know those, those Christians that are like, they've been kind of so sheltered, um, they just kind of believe everything, right? Um, that is not Thomas. That was not Thomas. Thomas comes in after missing the risen Christ. I don't know what Thomas was doing. Maybe he went out to go get a cup of coffee, comes back and he's like, did I miss anything? And they're like, huh. <laughs> he comes back and they say, we have, we have seen the Lord. Now, after hearing that, Thomas says, I'll tell you what, until I see his hands, until I see his feet, until I see his side, I'm not gonna believe so here's the thing. For 2,000 years, we have, been, we, we have been beating up on Thomas, doubting Thomas. Don't be like Thomas, Thomas. Thomas. And we're very judgmental when it comes to how we look at Thomas. Here's the thing with Thomas. Imagine if you had been following someone for three and a half years. He loved him more than anything. You saw miraculous works, and he was dead. And he had been dead for three days. Thomas was disappointed. Thomas was discouraged. Thomas was probably sad and depressed. Thomas was confused. Thomas was all these things. And here's what Thomas did. Listen, this is very, very, very important. In the time of that stress or depression or fear or anxiety or whatever the case, in that moment of turmoil, what Thomas did is he resorted to his physical senses. And we judge that and we go, oh, I can't believe he did that. How many times do we, in moments of stress and fear of overwhelmingness, how often do we run to food instead of Jesus? How often do we run to pornography instead of Jesus? How often do we run to vegging out and watching Netflix for 10 hours instead of Jesus? How often do we, well, I'll just go there. How often do we go to a pill before we go to Jesus? How often do we go to a drink or a joint before we go to Jesus, how many times do we, how many times have we done exactly what Thomas did, and in that moment of pressure, we result to our physical senses versus our spiritual insight? A lot of us, right? And so Thomas did what a lot of us would do in that situation, and I think we need to show him a little bit of grace. Here's the thing about Thomas, though. He didn't give up. It says a week later, he was back with the disciples again, again, more than likely in a worship service. Maybe they're singing, maybe they're eating food together, maybe they're praying together. Jesus shows up again, 
peace be with you. Now, maybe the only time, you know, the only person scared this time was probably Thomas. And Jesus walks up to Thomas and he goes, I think you wanted to see these. And he says, touch my hands. Here, touch my side, Thomas. And then he says, don't be faithless, believe. I don't believe this is Jesus scolding Thomas. I don't believe this is Jesus condescending him or, or making an example of him. I don't, I don't think that's what Jesus is doing. I think Jesus is actually saying, man, look, sometimes we're gonna be down, but you just have to trust me. You just have to keep looking for me. You just have to keep searching. There are some of you in this place right now where, where life has beaten you up so much that you're kind of sarcastic, you're cynical. I won't believe it till I see it. The point is, is you have to keep looking. You have to keep digging. And if you do, you will have an encounter with Christ. I absolutely guarantee it. And so Thomas says, you got to see, but blessed are those who don't see this kind of proof. Now listen, you and I will more than likely, I'm going to go ahead and say probably 100%, not going to have a, a situation like Thomas had. If you're struggling with doubt in here right now, I, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings or let you down. I don't think Jesus is going to show up at your house tonight and be like, hey, you want to touch these? You want to you know, put your hands here? It's probably not going to happen. But Paul talks about this. Paul says in Romans chapter 120, we have plenty of evidence that God exists. We have plenty of it. Um, just go out and look at the world around you. The difference is not that we don't have evidence that God exists. The problem is there's a lot of people who are not looking for God. Let me tell you why so many people don't see God in the United States anymore. It is impossible to see God when we're constantly focused on our own image. That's why the word of the year a couple of years ago was selfie. As much as humanity has evolved, the best we could do a couple of years ago was selfie. That's our word of the year, Right? That's it. And it's quite ridiculous. And it's the reason why more people don't see God because they're not even looking for God. Well, I've never seen God. Are you looking? Listen, if you're a parent in here and you have kids, every time I look at my girls, I see God. If you've ever flown over the Grand Canyon, you've seen God. If you've ever been to Maui, I don't mean to sound all bougie. <laughs> if you go to a place like Maui, it's where my wife and I took our honeymoon, it's impossible to look at that island and be like, there's no God. When, when you look around at other people, when you look around at the miraculous things that happen in our life, when you walk out tonight, if the sky is clear and you see the moon and you see that Venus is here and Jupiter is there, there is evidence all around us. The problem is that we have to have a desire to see it. And here's the thing. I said this a minute ago. If you are in this room and you're on the fence about this, you're skeptical about this, if you are digging with a sincere heart and an open mind, Jesus said in Matthew chapter seven, for those who seek, they will find if you are digging with an open heart and an open mind, I guarantee you, you'll have an encounter with God. I guarantee you, you'll see it. Why? Because Jesus said it. For those who look, they find. They find. And so here's the thing. I love the last two verses of this, this chapter. In verse 30 and 31, John says, listen, there's a lot more that Jesus did, but I didn't record that. John says, and he's going to go on in the next chapter to say, Jesus did so much you couldn't fill all the books on earth with it. But, but, but John says, I, I recorded specific things. Why? So that you, the reader, would read these specific accounts, these miracles, these things that Jesus did, that you would read this and that you would believe that he is the son of God. And not just believe, but believe. And then because of that belief, gain life. To have life I love this, to have life in his name, that there is no living, there is no truly living, there is no peace and fulfillment and contentment and joy in anything apart from Jesus's name. So John's documentation of the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus is, is a, it's a roadmap on how we find life. It's a roadmap on how we, we, we understand what it means to truly live to have purpose, to have value now and have the hope of an eternal life with God in paradise forever. So there are four interesting people in this chapter. There's five, but I'm, I'm, I'm excluding Jesus, right? There are four very interesting individuals in this chapter. And we can identify, I think, for the most part, with one of these four. The first one, I think a lot of men identify with Peter. Peter was impulsive, Lost his cool sometimes. Guy comes to arrest Jesus. He picks up a sword, cuts his ear off. 
Jesus is like, come on, Peter. If you live by the sword, you die by the sword. He didn't think sometimes. And some of us in this room, our impulsivity gets us into trouble. And we identify with that. If you don't identify with impulsivity, there are some of us in this room who, when times of trouble arise, we deny Jesus. Well, Corey, I've never denied Jesus. Let's go back to something I said earlier. In those times of stress, if we run to anything other than Jesus, we are in essence denying him. And we do that a lot, right? So maybe we identify with Peter. Maybe we identify with Mary. Mary was marginalized. She was on the fringe. She wasn't valued as much as other people. Maybe like Mary, we have an awful past. Maybe we have a very dark past. Maybe we have dabbled in some very, very ugly, evil things. Maybe those things have overtaken us. Maybe we were controlled by those things. Maybe we identify with Mary. Maybe we identify with Thomas. Thomas was the skeptic. Thomas was the one who got beaten down. He was ground down. And he's like, I'll believe it when I see it. And maybe life has ground down some of us in this room to where we've just become kind of cynical. Man, I flirt with that sometimes. Anyone else? Sometimes if you watch enough news and you're around enough people, you're like, we are awful. And you become very cynical, right? Very callous. Or, you know where I think a lot of us land? Is we're we're the good ones. I put good in quotation marks because the Bible said our goodness is like filthy rags compared to God. So good by our standards is not much compared to God. But John was the good one. John was the the disciple that Jesus loved. John was the one that took Jesus' mother into his house. John is the only one that was present at the cross. Maybe we're more like John. We come to church every week. We check off the boxes. We look the part. We act the part. But even in our appearance of godliness, we have forgotten the power and the promises of Jesus. We've forgotten not only the promises and the word of God, we've forgotten that if we have the Holy Spirit, we are to live a certain way. And we are to be empowered by that Holy Spirit. And some of us are good on paper, but we're not really living out the power of God. Not really living in that identity. So here's the thing, regardless of what we, 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 we kind of associate with, regardless of what our background is, that's irrelevant. The color of your skin, your gender, the mistakes you've made, all of that is irrelevant. What Jesus is looking for is not your past or or, or, or what the world says you are. What Jesus is looking for is he's looking for the ones who want to hear truth. He's looking for the ones who want to change and to see a difference in their life. And if we will come to to, to, to the crucified and resurrected Christ, any of us, If we will be humble and submit to him, we can be saved. Not only saved, we can be empowered. What does that mean? We can have healthy relationships. We can have healthy marriages. We can raise great kids. We can can, uh, make sure that, that, that we live above the reproach and the evil of the world, that we can do that if we just put our faith in him. And we can live fulfilled, content lives. We're also offered a relationship with God. Which means until the physical Jesus returns, we have the spiritual Jesus with us all the time to help us navigate life, to give us comfort, to counsel us, to lead us, to give us wisdom and discernment and knowledge and courageous faith. These are all gifts of the Spirit. To give us the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, self-control. My Lord, that's an absent thing in our society. And we get those things from the Spirit. And we have life in his name. But here's the thing about life in his name. Go back to to, to what Jesus did with the disciples, right? Living is not just for us. Living is intended for all people. The Bible says it is not God's intention that any perish. The Bible says it is not God's intention that any spiritually die. We're all going to literally die, but it's not his intention that any of us go to hell, any of us spiritually die. So that means that we have a job to do. Look what the disciples did. I don't want you to miss this. The disciples locked themselves in a room with people that thought and felt just like they did. And what did Jesus say when he came into the room? It's not my intention for you to be in this room. Go out. I'm here to send you out. What do do I mean by that? 
Christians, it is not our job to just create a social enclave where we hang out with people just like us and never engage the outside world. That is not what the church is supposed to do. But Corey, it's dangerous out there. Heck yeah, it's dangerous. That's why Jesus said, I send you out like sheep among wolves. But what if we get hurt? That's why Jesus said, I will send you out like lambs to be slaughtered. Can I ruin next week's lesson for you real quick? In next week's lesson, in, in, the, in the final chapter of, of, of John, Peter and Jesus are sitting there on the beach eating fish, right? They're having this conversation. Listen, if you haven't heard anything I've said, I want you to hear this. Jesus looked at Peter and he said, Peter, right now you're free. But eventually people are going to tie you up. They're going to beat you and take you somewhere you don't want to go. The Bible says, Jesus was telling Peter how Peter was going to die. You are going to go through exactly what I just went through, Peter. And you know what Jesus says right after he tells Peter how he's going to violently die? You know what he says? Follow me. Is it a dark, scary world out there? 100%. But let me encourage you, Christians, the light never has to fear the darkness. There is, there is no way the darkness can overcome you. We've already learned from the gospel of John in chapter 16, Jesus wins. And if we possess Jesus, we're on the winning team. Jesus does not want us to create a little bubble to where we never get out of it. Jesus says, it's time for you to go and do what I have done. To go out, yes, 100% the Great Commission. So listen, Jesus was resurrected not because he just wanted to do something different. Jesus was resurrected so you and I could be resurrected. Now, here we go. We are resurrected so now we can be a catalyst in someone else being resurrected. And on and on it goes. I'm so sick of hearing Christians talking about what they can get out of the church. Listen, if you've been a Christian longer than three and a half years and you're not doing anything, it's time to do something. That's why Jesus said, right? It's time to go. You've been with me for three and a half years. I've poured into you. Now it's time to go pour out. Now listen, we have to continually be poured into for the sake of being poured out. That's what we are called to do. So here's the thing. We have two choices today, right? Two choices every day. But, but maybe we'll draw a line in the sand and, and make a decision today. Right now, the world tells you follow yourself. You guys hear it all the time, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously. Do what you want to do, right? Follow your heart, follow your dreams, follow your passions, you, 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 you. And in a society that says, follow ourselves, it's all about the individual, it's all about your comfort, it's all about your pleasure. I step back from that, and I'm sure a lot of you do as well, and you see the fruit of a society that only follows its own passions. Uh, we have lost our flipping minds right? We are tearing each other apart. We are doing irreparable damage on children, on ourselves, on, on, on people around us in the pursuit of following us. Do you want to know what the basis of satanic thought is according to the satanic church? You know, most satanists do not believe in the devil. The point of satanism is to worship yourself as a God. Do you know where they get that from? They get it from Genesis chapter three. The satanists are right on this. The original intent of the devil was not for Eve to worship him. What does he say? Go back and read it yourself. They're sitting there looking at the tree and the devil goes, you know, if you do what you want to do, you'll be like God. This is the original lie. The original lie is not to worship Satan. The original lie is to worship yourself. I call that America. That's what we live in right now. It is absolutely amazing. And it causes destruction and chaos and eternal death. That's one option. The other option is we can pursue a resurrected Christ. Listen, there, there has, it, is, it is fascinating to me that we will put our hope in governments and, and economic systems and entertainers. Have any of them died for you? Can you tell me a politician that has died for you as an individual? Why in the world would we put our hope in that? Let alone, has anyone resurrected for you? Has anyone conquered the grave for you? 
If we will pursue not ourselves, but a resurrected Savior, we are spiritually resurrected now. We live fulfilling, valued lives now in the hope that when we are physically resurrected, everyone will be physically resurrected, but will we be physically resurrected to eternal life or eternal death? And if we follow and pursue Jesus, we'll be resurrected to eternal life with him forever. So the question that we must be honest about today is this. As you and I are standing in this room this morning, if we were to open up the, the, the cage of our heart and, and if we were to be honest with ourselves, listen, you have to be honest with yourself this morning. I have to be honest with myself. What is it that I truly put my hope in? You know, there's a lot of people selling out their dignity right now for a bunch of little hearts. Isn't that crazy? Guys, when you step away from that, is, is, is that insane to anyone else besides me? Well, Corey, I make a lot of money, like, you know, doing my TikTok posts. I'm like, I don't care. How much is your dignity worth? It's not worth that much. You know, I, 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 I'm not going to sacrifice my dignity and my integrity so I can make a couple of bucks from looking like an idiot on TikTok. But there are people who will sell themselves out for a little thumb, for a little heart, because their hope is in, listen, because their hope is in the affirmation of people. That's what their hope is in. There are people who will sell out their integrity and their dignity for money because ultimately their hope is in material possession. There are people who will sell out friendships and family and, and also their integrity and everything else for a political party because at the end of the day, if they're honest with themselves, their hope is in the government. What is our hope in? Where, where do we find our value? Where do we find our fulfillment? Is it possible, if we're being honest, you and I today, is it possible that maybe we've been looking for the wrong things? That maybe we have been pursuing the wrong ventures? Maybe we have been looking at the wrong images? Maybe we've been pursuing the wrong thing? And let me ask you this. Have you, have you, have we, leaned, not just into the fact that we know Jesus was crucified. Most Christians, we, we intellectually know, yes, Jesus was crucified for me. Listen, understanding, not just in our brain, but in our heart, that, that Jesus Christ, that the word became flesh, John 1, the word became flesh, dwelt among us, the Bible says, willingly was nailed to a cross, dead for three days, resurrected by his own power. If we truly got in our heads and in our hearts, Jesus did that for you, for you, for me, for you, individuals, right? Mary, for us, he did that. If we got that and if we lived in that resurrection, if we lived in that love and in that power of God, boy, how much differently we would live. What are we running after? What are we running after? Would you bow your heads with me, please?